All right, squad, today we are bringing our brains to class. I mean, we've been using our brains all along, but now we get to put them under the microscope. So the charge of the day is figuring out how we go from the presence of light, as we've been discussing, to activity that the brain can understand. This is gonna come in two parts. First, we need a way for the system to know whether or not there is light present. So we need a code that the brain can interpret as light. And we need a way of discriminating between different wavelengths of light to get us closer to perceiving color. So to begin to answer the first question, how does the visual system code for light? We need a quick overview of what we mean by coding. That is, what is the information that the brain is getting? Brains, of course, can't actually see. Brains can't respond to light. Brains can only make sense of a specific type of electrochemical change, the neural code. So let's see where that comes from. The nervous system, which includes the brain, spinal cord, sensory receptors, and other systems, is made up of a kind of cell called a neuron. Here, the neurons are shown in red, spreading throughout the body. And neurons carry information from the brain to the body to initiate movement. They also carry information from the body to the brain about sensory inputs like pressure on the skin, uh, the presence of chemicals that we perceive as tastes and smells, and in our case, the presence of light. So the nervous system is made up of these individual neurons. The code that they carry is called an action potential. Uh, it is a temporary brief change in the electrical charge of the neuron that's caused by changes in the levels of ions inside the cell. You often hear action potentials being described colloquially as a neuron firing. It is in fact carrying a signal from a, a signal and a charge from one end of the neuron to the other. And when it reaches the end of a neuron, information about that signal can be transmitted to other neurons. And therefore, neurons can communicate and send information throughout the body to the brain and within the brain. One feature I want to particularly highlight about action potentials uh, is that they are binary signals. They are zeros and ones. A cell is either firing, that means having an action potential, or it is not. Action potentials don't have a size or a magnitude. They are just happening or not happening. So in order to code for or represent different levels of activity, such as brighter, more intense lights, we can't have bigger or smaller action potentials because that doesn't exist. Instead, what we see are changes in the rates of action potentials. So the firing rate, the rate at which action potentials are occurring, has the potential to increase or decrease. So let's watch this in action. Here you can see individual neurons. The light represents action potentials. And action potentials are caused by those positively charged ions being pulled into the cell temporarily and then exiting it again. So the first challenge I mentioned that we have to deal with is how the visual system codes for the presence of light. The process of converting light into neural code is called phototransduction. Somehow light goes in and action potentials come out the back of the retina and are sent up to the brain. So how do we go from light outside the eye to action potentials in the optic nerve? As you read, at the back of the eye is the light-sensitive retina. And you can see there are multiple layers of light-sensitive neurons there. Let's zoom in a little bit. This is a, a zoomed in view of the same orientation. So the front of the eye is at the left side of the screen and the very back of the eye is at the right. Each of the colored circles, cylinders in the middle are different types of neurons. Uh, we're gonna talk the most about photoreceptors, uh, the rods and cones at the back and retinal ganglion cells at the front. I wanna explicitly point out uh, this very unintuitive layout of the retina. This is something that often trips people up. So light enters the eye and it has to pass through all of these layers of cells before it finally arrives at the light sensitive region uh, at the back of the rods and cones. And then the information is carried back up toward the retinal ganglion cells before it, uh, toward, toward the front of the eye before it exits. So why this counterintuitive layout? It's not entirely clear. Um, it may be to help uh, regenerate the photopigment that is the light sensitive matter that is in the, the rods and the cones. So the tips of the photoreceptors are embedded in the choroid layer that you can see at the right side of the screen. And the choroid has a really rich blood supply. So when the photopigments in the rods and the cones uh, break down uh, via the process of transduction, 
the choroid can more easily get nutrients to the rods and cones to help regenerate that photopigment. The process of phototransduction begins when light contacts a pigment in the photoreceptors called retinol. Here's a rod, but the process is the same in cones. Inside the rod are discs, which contain visual pigment molecules that have two components. Opsins, which are large protein strands, and retinol, the star of our show, which is a light-sensitive molecule. Phototransduction occurs when the retinol absorbs a single photon of light. That, when the retinol absorbs a photon, it causes one of the double bonds between the carbon atoms to break, which makes the retinol change its shape. The process of changing its shape is called isomerization. It's a very special treat. I think we have a little bit of actual footage of a cone catching photons, so you can see how it works. Ah, oh. damn it. I caught a photon, I caught a photon! <laughs> All right, when the retinol isomerizes, it leads to an electrochemical cascade that affects the levels of ions in the photoreceptors, which changes their charge. The change in activity in the photoreceptors ultimately leads to changes in activity in the bipolar cells and the retinal ganglion cells. Uh, so, so what began as light hitting the photoreceptor ends up being coded as an increase or decrease in the rate of action potentials from the retinal ganglion cells being carried up to the brain. Remember I said that the rate of action potentials can go up or down depending on uh, the stimulus. And that's gonna be really important in a couple of class periods when we talk about opponent process theory. So these are the really broad strokes of the process. If you want more information on the nitty gritty of the physiology of phototransduction, there's an optional video on Moodle to feed your curiosity. So critically, each retinal ganglion cell gets input from multiple different cones simultaneously. So here's a schematic of a retinal ganglion cell whose activity is affected by something like two dozen different cones shown up at the top. So the signal that gets sent to the brain from that retinal ganglion cell is influenced by lots and lots of cones. And this is going to be important for many reasons, but one consequence of it is that it limits the spatial resolution of the eye. So for example, this retinal ganglion cell can't tell the difference between activity in this cone and in this cone. So that means that for some locations that are very close together in space will be coded by the same retinal ganglion cell. It's also important to note that cones and the retinal ganglion cells they connect to um, code for different areas of the visual field. So if we shine a spot of light here as shown, this retinal ganglion cell is activated. If we shine a spot here, it will lead to activity in a different retinal ganglion cell that sends signals up to the brain. So we know about where in the visual field objects are by looking at which retinal ganglion cells are active. And to give a sense of the amount of convergence um, from cones to retinal ganglion cells, there are about 125 million photoreceptors, but only about 1 million retinal ganglion cells in each eye. So the, the signal from cone to retinal ganglion cell gets condensed a lot by the time it leaves the eye. So at this point, we can answer the question, how does the visual system code for the presence of light? And the short answer is that the rate of action potentials in the retinal ganglion cell are sensitive to changes in illumination. But we also want to know how much light and what wavelengths of light. And so for that, we turn to trichromatic theory. So as you read, trichromatic theory describes the fact that there are three different types of cones in the retina that are each maximally sensitive to different wavelengths of light. And the reason that they're sensitive to different wavelengths has to do with different types of photopigment. That is, the retinol in each type of cone is sensitive to different wavelengths of light. So if short wavelength light hit the retinol in a long wavelength sensitive cone, it isn't likely to cause it to isomerize and ultimately wouldn't lead to changing the firing rates of the retinal ganglion cells. This graph shows the relative sensitivity of short, shown in blue, medium, shown in green, and, red, and long, shown in red, wavelength sensitive cones. So a short wavelength sensitive cone is the most sensitive to about 440 nanometer wavelength light. The graph is showing relative sensitivity, but I've heard that it's also useful to think of this uh, probabilistically, such that it is the most likely that 440 nanometer light striking a cone will lead to isomerization in that cone, but 500 nanometer light striking the cone may still lead to isomerization, but it is less likely. 
So you sometimes uh, hear these referred to as blue, green, and red sensitive cones. But in fact, short wavelength sensitive cones, or S cones, can be somewhat, somewhat stimulated by green light. And medium and long wavelength cones are sensitive to nearly the whole visual spectrum, just at different levels of sensitivity. But the fact that a photoreceptor may be stimulated by different wavelengths of light actually poses a real challenge for interpreting coding of wavelengths of light. Here's why. So we're going to zoom in here on just our S cones, our short wavelength sensitive cones. If we were to shine 500 nanometer green light on it, it would lead to a small change in cone activity. That cone would catch some of the photons, some of the retinol would isomerize, and we'd see this small change in activity. Now notice that by the time the, the cone has coded for light, it loses the information about wavelength. All cones can do is report photon counts. So that green light leads it to say, yeah, there's not too many photons here, but I caught a couple. If we were to shine 460 nanometer bluish light, that cone would catch more photons and we would see more change in activity. So, okay, you may say at this point, this cone can distinguish between blue light and green light because blue causes a big change in activity and green causes a small change in activity. But here's the problem. Let's shine 410 nanometer indigo light on the cell. It ends up giving the same response as the green light. The cone is just saying, caught a few photons, and it gets even worse. If we take that same 460 nanometer blue light, but we present it at a lower intensity, so it is less bright, now there are fewer photons present, and even though it's likely to catch lots of them, there are just fewer there to catch. So the change in activity in the cone is somewhat small. Oh yeah, and it's even worse than that actually, because if there is a very bright 500 nanometer green light, even though it isn't terrible, the cone isn't very sensitive to that wavelength, if there are enough photons present because of how bright it is, it can catch a lot of them. So, despite the fact that these six different stimuli differ from one another in wavelength and brightness and intensity, the individual cones can't distinguish between them. So this is known as the principle of univariance. It describes the fact that an individual cone can't tell the difference between, for instance, a bright green light and a dark blue light, or between indigo and green at, at the same intensity. It means, in effect, that any given cone is colorblind. The short wavelength sensitive cones on their own can't tell us much about what wavelengths of light are present. All they can do is tell the brain the number of photons they caught but not the wavelengths or the intensities. So how does the brain distinguish between green and blue or any other, any other pairs of colors? It relies on the fact that we don't just have one kind of cone to deal with. Even though any single cone may be colorblind in effect, together they are not. So back to all three types of cones. As we just saw, the presence of short wavelength blue light will cause a large change in the activity of the short wavelength sensitive cones. The medium and long cones, those sensitive to medium and long wavelength light, are still somewhat sensitive to short wavelength light, so they may show small changes in their activity. Note that the medium cones are responding, are showing a larger change in response than the long wavelength sensitive cones because the medium wavelength sensitive cones are slightly more sensitive to short wavelengths than long ones are, indicated by the higher line at 450 nanometers, a uh, higher green line than, than a red one. So we code for blue as lots of activity in short cones, more in a little in medium cones, and a tiny, tiny bit in, in the long wavelength sensitive cones. Let's try another, another wavelength. If we look at yellow, so that yellow is coded as the highest levels of stimulation of medium wavelength sensitive cones, and moderately high for long wavelength, and very little stimulation of the shorties. Green is similar, but with somewhat lower levels of medium and long, and higher of short. So every point along the visible spectrum provides a different level of activity across the three cone types collectively. This is referred to as population coding. Information about wavelength and intensities of light present are determined by the simultaneous activity of all three cone types together.
Now, there's one thing that's really important to note, and that is that this process of converting light into changes in cone activity means we're undergoing some serious information loss. Light goes into the eye as a continuous distribution of brightnesses at multiple wavelengths, but what comes out of the eye is just cone counts, right? How many photons each of those cones managed to catch. And what that means is that two very different types of stimuli could go into the eye, but if they produce the same cone activity, they are indistinguishable. They look exactly the same to us. So let's say we have a broad spectrum, an achromatic source like this, could be daylight. Lots of wavelengths are present, so high levels of activity in all three cones. Alternatively, an artificial light source, such as fluorescent bulbs, that has spikes of intensity at a more narrow range, will also lead to the same level of activity in the cones. So I'm, I'm calling this information loss because these are two different stimuli. These are two different kinds of light that are hitting the eye. They have different intensities at different wavelengths. Uh, but because they create the same level of activity in the cones, they end up being indistinguishable to us. To summarize, the answer to our first question is that changes in activity in cones lead to changes in the rates of action potentials in retinal ganglion cells, and that's how we code for the presence of light. And the visual system distinguishes between different wavelengths of light via the simultaneous level of activity in all three cone types simultaneously. So in class, we're going to continue to build on this and think about how the, the phenomena that we've described here help us to understand some of the really cool things we've experienced so far in class, like metamers and magenta. See you in class.